Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Um, I'm just going to follow on from oh, yes. Alex's uh, presentation. Um, I'm a haematologist and uh, what's commonly called a, a clotter, because I deal with hemostasis and thrombosis. Um, but I've always had an interest in mastocytosis. And then over recent years, that's expanded into mast cell disorders. So th there's a bit of overlap. I'll, I'll, I'll flick through the slides where we are, we've overlapped significantly. But it's really just presenting my, my own um, experience. So it's relatively limited. So um, a lot of uh, patients now have self-diagnosed before they come to see a doctor, but the patients that come with a mast cell disorder are quite often um, have such a depth of research um, when they come that I, I've actually learnt a lot um, from, from them. So this is really um, a defence um, of the, the uh, entity um, of mast cell activation syndrome, whether you, you take one definition or another, uh, because a lot of colleagues um, reject the, the, the whole concept. So um, taking um, uh, um, an example, 100 patients from my um, practice, about 20% have systemic mastocytosis, 3% have a monoclonal um, mast cell activation syndrome. 60% have um, a non-clonal mast cell activation syndrome and about 16 have this hereditary um, alpha or um, hypertryptosemia. So just to run through a little bit about each of these, um, mastocytosis um, has clear-cut uh, WHO definitions, either cutaneous, um, where you've got typical skin lesions, usually urticaria pigmentosa, um, and on biopsy of characteristic clusters of mast cells. Um, in, as hematologists, we uh, deal with uh, the more systemic form, and uh, it needs a bone marrow uh, to um, make that de definition. So it's either one major criterion and one minor criterion, or at least three minor criteria. So um, the major criteria is clusters of 15 or more mast cells in an aggregate, um, usually in the bone marrow. And then the minor criteria are that more than 25% of mast cells show abnormal morphology, um, CKIP mutation, um, which can be picked up usually from bone marrow, but with more sensitive techniques, also from peripheral blood, um, and um, that there's aberrant expression of two CD, CD2 and or uh, 25 or 117, and that the total tryptase level is greater than 20. So... In mastocytosis, there are two mechanisms. So the majority of patients just have their symptoms from um, mast cell degranulation and release of some of the many substances. But in a small minority, there's actual mast cell infiltration in a more aggressive form into the organs. And uh, that's usually called aggressive um, mastocytosis and the prognosis there is is not so good and then we've got the mast cell activation syndromes so if it's monoclonal um, they they usually have a higher baseline tryptase and bone marrow shows monoclonal mast cells but not fulfilling the criteria for mastocytosis uh, and then the more common non-clonal mast cell activation syndrome that Alex has talked about and then secondary um, forms of that. And, and also some patients may come along who've got one of the histamine overdrive um, disorders. For uh, monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome, this is really um, a, a pre-mastocytosis condition. So it's a progressive mast cell disorder. Um, and they may present with anaphylaxis, in this, unusually, compared to the non-clonal, it's usually men rather than women, and there's an absence of urticaria, angioedema, and uh, presyncope. 
The, the triptase level um, is less than 20, um, but may then rise. So uh, if the level is greater than 20, then you do a bone marrow, um, or sooner if they have a history of hypotension. And, and you follow them up to look for signs of developing into full-blown mastocytosis. And um, so, definitions of mast cell activation syndrome, as Alex said, are um, disputed. So, this is um, the Moldrin or Afrin definitions. Um, so, multiple symptoms in at least two organ systems, evidence of mast cell mediators in ra raised amounts, and response or partial response um, to mast cell stabilizers and or mediator blockers. And these patients, um, as has been mentioned, have multiple system um, problems. And uh, you need a lot of time to sit down and run through these. And often they feel like this. So... Um, they may have a long history um, of either chronic persistent symptoms that with um, stepwise worsening uh, with polymorbidity, whereas they actually look quite well. And, and often it's an interaction between the environmental and hereditable factors. Unfortunately, the symptoms are often nonspecific and um, there may be years and years of um, illness and incorrect diagnoses and, as Alex says, uh, often being told that it's all in their heads. I think it's really important, um, as has already been said by several speakers, that um, identifiable underlying conditions are looked for, such as doing uh, serum cortisol um, and other tests that will exclude other conditions. Often by the time patients come to me, all of those tests have been done. And um, there, is, there is an epigenetic process that may substantially contribute to a transgenerational transmission. Often patients ha say that their relatives have one or more aspects of a triad of either um, hypermobility, EDS, or POTS, or MCAS. So um, this is no joke um, if you are a patient who can't tolerate most foods. So um, Peter Valent is um, an Austrian uh, hematologist um, who developed the mastocytosis criteria. Um, and he's adapted that um, with colleagues to um, uh, give a definition for MCAS, uh, which, as Alex says, doesn't accept that there's a baseline chronic problem um, and just um, uses this particular definition. Now, there are problems with that. There's no real strong published data to support that. It's just been adapted from the mastocytosis def um, <clears throat> definition. And can we say that um, commercially available tryptase assays are precise enough to uh, allow this um, when the levels may be very low to start off with? So this is a quote at the bottom from Lawrence Afrin. So if you've got a baseline of two and um, during a flare it goes up to 4.3 or less, then it fails to qualify for a diagnosis of MCAS but if it goes um, between 4.4 to 10.9, then it does qualify, even though that is within the normal range. So you can see that really that doesn't hold water. So um, we've said we don't think that we should be um, solely uh, focusing on serum tryptase. Um, and, and the reason people do is that it is the most stable and most easily accessible test to do. But you do get variable results and you're only looking at a total tryptase. So in my mastocytosis patients, um, often they've got levels greater than 200, but may have very little in the way of symptoms. Whereas those with lower levels, but with a defined diagnosis, uh, may have more symptoms. And so it isn't, it isn't the complete answer. Um, there's also often poor access to 
trip days test when you want to uh, have it done during a symptom, particularly symptomatic a spell, during a flare, and often it's not processed um, in a rapid way, so you don't get the results. And um, Theoredes has been mentioned by Alex. Um, this is a quote from him that they could, the results could be both inadequate and misleading because we know that mast cells um, secrete many mediators uh, without any tryptase and, and that mast cells vary from different uh, places in the body. So they don't accept this chronic aberration of mast cell activity, as we've mentioned. <laughs> Um, however, um, as I mentioned, some patients with proven mastocytosis have normal levels um, and others have persistently greatly elevated tryptase without uh, evidence of allergic reactions. Um, and there's also reports that you can have false high results from uh, interference uh, by antibodies. So... Um, I've put this um, greater than 200 mast cell substances in, in red because I, I gather that recently there's been a publication um, that there's over a 1,000 substances. So um, what, whatever level we take is, is a large number of, of different substances of which tryptase is only a single one. So um, some of the arguments against using other mast cell mediators um, is that at the moment, no single finding uh, can confidently establish a diagnosis and access to the relevant test is very limited and expensive. There's rapid de degradation of, of, of uh, these substances once uh, they are out of the body. Mast cells themselves live in tissues. They're not easily accessible. The mediators are released intermittently, so the sample may not be taken at the right time, but they're more likely to be positive at the time when the patient's most unwell and difficult to come uh, to clinic or to uh, provide a 24-hour urine sample. But uh, hopefully in the future, routine assessment for one of the um, mutational profiles uh, will show that um, the pro what the process is driving mast cell activation. Um, and what about tissue biopsies? Uh, it could be argued that it could be either a cause or an effect of a process that's going on. Um, but Muldrens uh, includes in his uh, definition uh, as a minor criterion uh, that the increased numbers of mast cells in tissues um, should be accepted as a, as a criterion. So uh, Alex has mentioned hereditary alpha or her her hereditary hypertryptosemia <laughs> symptoms, uh, which is an autosomal dominant uh, condition. We're learning more about this, and uh, I've also sent um, a large number of samples to Peter Arkwright, um, for analysis. Um, it's said that higher tryptase gene copy number is associated with higher levels of tryptase um, and also more severe clinical symptoms. But uh, one of our families that we've tested, um, the father of the index case, who has never had any symptoms, has a tryptase level of 90. So um, we've still got a lot to learn, I think, about um, this as... Um, a syndrome. So it seems that um, a number of people will have raised tryptase but not have the actual um, syndrome. So um, thinking of, across this spectrum uh, of mast cell disorders, um, there are many sim similarities in the symptom symptomology, mastocytosis, monoclonal and non-monoclonal -mo non mast cell activation syndrome, and this hereditary uh, tryptosemia. And um, also similarities in response to treatment. Um, in terms of um, biomarkers, I think it is helpful if we can identify um, a biomarker that is acceptable um, towards the definition of the condition. And so I try to do this where possible. Um, with um, very little success uh, with regards to chromogranin A, okay. and um, the vast majority of MCAS patients have normal tryptase. But uh, 
more uh, helpfully, the prostaglandins um, are fairly specific. As I said, they, they have much higher level um, from mast cells um, than from any other process that's going on. And um, so the D2 is the most specific, breaks down into P, PGF2 alpha and PGDM. In my experience, uh, 24 hour urine sample is best, keeping it uh, chilled um, throughout the process, um, and it produces positive results um, in quite a high percentage of patients. But as Alex said, being cautious about the F2 alpha uh, and um, women of reproductive age. So, so there are similarities across the, the spectrum of the biomarkers. Um, the, the prostaglandins are much more raised in systemic mastocytosis, but are also raised in quite a number of mast cell activation syndrome patients and in hereditary tryptosemia. And then there's also, we've done some um, research in proteonomics, um, and this is um, showing upregulation of um, the proteins um, in mastocytosis, and the case in red is a patient with hereditary alpha trip tryptosemia. So you can see that there, there are similarities in the pattern of the proteins that are upregulated, and we aim to do the same with the mast cell activation syndrome patients. So um, because of time, I shall um, be very brief on this, but um, you know um, your experience with POTS patients that they often do have hypermobility. And from our side, um, the mast cell patients quite frequently have one or both of those. So um, Alex has already mentioned this, but just a word, um, I'm a great fan of ketotifen. And actually we, we do, some of our patients are getting hold of this. And the Mast, uh, Masto Society um, has updates on their website. Um, I, I have been using low-dose naltrexone recently uh, with some success, starting extremely uh, with small amounts and increasing slowly. Um, Really, uh, it seems to be helpful um, for, for pain and for um, fatigue. Um, and we've talked about mindfulness and yoga and those um, things. And I do uh, concur with Alex that I think it's really important that the patient knows that you are um, accepting that their symptoms are real and you gain the trust of the patient before mentioning anything to do with the mind um, but we do know the mind has a huge impact on the body and we're using mindfulness in cancer patients we're going to use it in our um, uh, patients with haemophilia shortly and uh, other chronic conditions um, what about a medic alert well they may react to it so it's uh, questionable whether they should have an alert bracelet Okay, so there is a lot more to say and a lot more to understand. These are slides from my American colleagues, which are slightly daunting and frightening in that um, there's um, a hypothesis that there's an infinite number of etiologies leading to multiple drivers that end up circling um, the same drain. They even use the term vortex rather than a cycle. Um, so... Uh, with that, I, I will stop. This is a um, aspirational picture of uh, Leicester Royal Infirmary, which Alex won't recognise. We've um, we've got uh, one element of it, which is the a new A and E department. But I think it's a bit like our understanding of muscle activation syndrome. It's only very partially there, and we've got a lot more to learn. Thank you.